As Mike said, we're going to focus on the specific challenge of sand production and how sand is managed across the life of a well. And we'll break, break the presentation into three, three sections. We'll begin with a look at the issues of sand production, its causes, its consequences, and the strategies available to, to mitigate those, those unwanted effects. Then we'll provide an introduction to visual analytics and the technologies that support this technique. And the third section will be where we explore what's possible through the application of this service with case studies based on, on some of the work we've performed. Here we go. So with sandstone reservoirs contributing quite a large share of oil and gas production around the world, sand production from those wells is fairly widespread and sometimes an expensive problem for, for energy companies. And we've highlighted on the map here just some of the more well-known locations with, with these sanding issues. Reservoirs that suffer from sand production often have some similar characteristics. They tend to be highly porous, so contain high volumes of hydrocarbon. They're often as well highly permeable, so they flow very well and, and are often prolific production wells with the added benefit of having high recovery rates. They often tend to be offshore reservoirs and they're often gas producers as well. So sand production occurs when the effective stresses in the reservoir exceed the strength of the sandstone. Getting a little bit of feedback there, if somebody could uh, check their mic isn't, isn't on, please. So when this uh, effective stress decreases, often during to, to, due to depletion, the effective stress in the reservoir drops and it causes the weakest sandstones to fail. And this can happen in successive parts of the reservoir as time passes and depletion continues. If the flow rate in the well is sufficiently high, then the loose sand particles that have been created are transported to surface as part of the, the, well, the well flow stream. And this can result in plugging of the surface facilities where, where the sand eventually settles and erosion of completion along the well path and in the flow lines and facilities at surface. The severity of the damage caused is dependent on the volume of sand and the velocity at which it's traveling. On the other hand, if the flow rate of the well is not high enough, then the loose sand isn't transported out of the well bore. The completion interval will gradually sand up and production will decline. And in this little video clip I'm showing here is an example of that that we've captured with the sand clearly gathering on the low side of the, of the horizontal well bore. If this sand production continues for an extended period, production might eventually stop all, altogether from, from the well. So fortunately, there are many options available for sand control and the selection depends on a number of factors. If the sandstone strength is high enough, then cementing the production liner or casing and selectively perforating, perhaps with oriented perforating charges, might be an option. If the grain size is suitable, then a slotted liner might be sufficient to deal with the problem. On the other hand, if rock strength, consolidation and grain size are low, then you may need to op opt for one of the many screen options available with a, with a gravel pack behind it. And if gravel pack is, is, a, is a problem and difficult, you may opt for an expandable screen. So these are just some of the options. There are, there are certainly more. But as well as these technical factors, operators will also need to consider the production rates required, 
and the cost and ease of installation to decide on the best solution. There's no equation that helps solve this problem, no one size fits all solution. Unfortunately, whatever method is chosen, sand control failures do occur. The type of failure and when they happen varies with time. And if we look at this reliability curve, often called a bath, a bathtub shaped curve in the reliability world, it describes the type of issues that we're dealing with. We can, we've broken it down into three main sections here. In the early life of the well, we may get damage even while running the, the control device into the well. Gravel pack and, the, and there's problems with the placement of gravel. We might get screen outs or other issues associated with that. The, the drawdown on the well is excess, excessively high during this early period, and this can cause issues as well. Drawdown management is a, is a key factor in throughout the life of the well. During the main operational period, some of the issues include um, fines production, so very, very small particles that lead to plugging in some parts of the, of the control device, and that leads to hot flow, hot spots in, in other, other parts of screens. And then the depletion that we talked about, that results in the, 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 the effective reservoir stress increasing and causing more, more sound. And in the later life of the well, perhaps we have to deal with water breakthrough, which in itself can bring more fines and it can cause scaling issues, again, resulting in plugging and, and potentially other hot spots in the, in the well. And then the final consideration maybe is, is for formation subsidence or, or fault movements that can be, can be caused when the, the reservoir pressure drops towards its uh, final, final values. The point here is that the, the risk of sand production is present throughout the life of the well and changes in conditions over time increase the likelihood of that sand control failure. So how do operators manage sand when it occurs? We've worked on this flow chart that I hope summarize it. It's fairly simple and, and generic, but it's one that could, could apply in, in a lot of cases. If sand production is detected, then you'd evaluate that against the allowable limits of, of, for, for sand production. And those limits might be a function of the mass or volume of sand, over a given period of time, or a function of how much erosion is actually occurring based either on surface sensors that you've got or, or some downhole measurements to, me to, cap to measure that erosion. If the production of sand is above the allowable limits, then the solution is normally to restrict flow choking back the well and reducing production until the sand reaches an acceptable limit. And at that point, you'd want to look at whether that production is adequate. And there's probably two things to consider here. Uh, the economics, whether you still have enough production to meet your targets or production contracts even. And if you're not, then you'll need to consider some remedial actions to, to deal with the issue that's causing sanding. And the other thing you probably want to look at is, um, is that production rate now adequate to give you the flow rate to lift the sand out of the well? Because if you leave it accumulating in the well, as we've seen, that can, that can build up and eventually totally kill the production. So again, if that's the case, you want to look at the remedial actions you can take. And even if production is adequate, it's suggested that you still want to consider remedial actions based on what, what return do you get? Is the, 
is the increased production by repairing economic in terms of the cost of doing that repair. So there may be a case there where, where the answer is yes. But if those remedial actions are successful, you can continue to produce the well, uh, monitoring it all the time and beginning this, this loop, loop again. So the, the remediation actions that I, I've mentioned here can come in a number of different solutions available. They're all relatively straightforward in, in concept and proven and have been used on, on, on lots of occasions, I'm sure. The real challenge, though, comes down to effectively diagnosing the issue, understanding the issue well enough to select one of these options. And if it's a subsurface solution, knowing exactly where to, where to place it. So knowing exactly how many wells are affected by sand production issues is, is actually quite difficult. How much production is lost and how many wells uh, I don't think anybody really knows, but I think we can safely say it's, it's known to be significant. Back in the early 2000s, BP led a consortium of operating companies who gathered together and published a database of, of 2,000 wells with different types of sand control devices in there, and between them several thousand well years of, of operational history. And this in part helped to identify the failure modes that we showed on that previous bathtub reliability curve. But to be more specific, we've taken an example from the North Sea where one of the largest operators reported that one third of their sand control wells were experienced sand production. The operator in question quickly worked out, and it was actually the title of their paper, that locating the site of site sand entry was critical to achieving some effective solutions for those problems. And they did have some success in identifying the source of sand using conventional case toll logging and sub subsequently isolating the, the, the sand production at its source. But they talked about several limitations with those methods. Methods they used weren't directly locating either the sand itself or assessing the integrity of the completion or the sand control device. The techniques required pre prior knowledge of, of the well production and construction by having base logs in place, and these weren't, weren't always available. And the logging tools used to acquire the data didn't have good enough resolution to identify smaller, more localized sites of sand entry. So in short, while many, sand, many of their sand control devices had failed, very few were actually successfully diagnosed and, and repaired. So that brings us on to the, to the next se section, our visual analytics. Uh, what, what is visual analytics? Well, put simply, it means quantified vision. By mapping the way the lens and other parts of the, our optical system manipulates the captured rays of light, we're able to calculate a transform function to restore the true geometry of the, of the object within the field of view. Um, in the first example we're looking at here, we're looking at down view images of an obstruction in the well. It happens to be some hydrates that could equally be fish, for example, top of a fish. We can see and measure the size, the orientation, the proximity to the pipe ID. And in the second example, we're looking at side view images of some small corrosive pitting. And we can measure and, and look at the size and the area of those pits. We can count the frequency, and we can even look at the rate of change of these pits over time using a, a time-lapse survey. The point here is making these measurements lets us 
lets us understand not just the, the root cause of the issue, but, but its severity. And we can do this in real time at the, at the well site. Sorry, my slides have paused a little bit here. We're coming on to a, a slide heavy in, in video images. So it may take a moment to, to load here. Here we are. So visual, visual analytics can be used in, and applied in a wide range of applications. And we're showing examples here of eight, eight of those different applications. The first here is looking at um, corrosion, and we can see the, the, the high level of detail which we're able to capture those very small corrosive pits. We've also had a great deal of success um, looking at perforations. So this is very similar to the application we're talking about here with, with sand control. Uh, this is mainly applied for hydraulic frac, at diagnosing hydraulic fracks. And we've gathered a great deal of experience. We've measured um, and analyzed tens of thousands of individual perforations using visual analytic methods. On water VA, we're able to help identify the source of water flow, uh, perhaps in conjunction with production logs in some cases, so they can be uh, isolated. In the leak VA example, again, we're looking for and helping diagnose leaks. In restriction VA, we're trying to understand the cause and severity of wellbore restrictions. And in fish, we're trying to help understand and recover the fish more effectively from, from the wellbore. In valve VA, we're trying to verify the performance of, of often you know, complex and moving pieces of hardware in the in the well. But of course, what we're looking at today is, is sand VA, where we're evaluating the performance of the sand control systems, trying to identify the source of sand and where it's flowing into the well. So let's look, on, look at our first case study here. Similar to the first short clip I, I showed you earlier, we're looking at sand in, the, in a horizontal well bore. This is a perforated well, and here we're going to look at a 50-foot interval, although it does extend much further than that in the, in the well. So this is a perforated well that was known to have sand production and fill issues that were affecting the production, and we were asked to help optimize the sand clean-out operation in this case. You see the smaller sand dunes on the bottom of the well, the, the well bore. This is actually, these images are actually taken after the clean out had been undertaken. And you'll see on the side of the well bore, the, the tide marks or where the original sand was placed. So up here, for example, that video is coming through. This where there's the original sand fill was in place. And now most of that sand has been removed. So the operator, when they when they saw the video images, was able to determine that the that the operation was deemed to be a success. Enough sand had been removed, production was restored, and the well was quickly brought back online after the after the camera operation was completed. Second example I'm going to show you is a much shorter video clip, but the still images we see at the end of it are really the, the key here. We can clearly see the difference between a, a clean section of sand screen on one depth with a filter medium visible through the base pipe holes compared with an almost fully blocked section of screen on, on the right here where the filter mesh is obscured by, by fines. 
And these images are of sufficient quality here in the clean area where you can see the, the, the makeup and even the condition of the sound screen, the screen and wire up behind the, behind the base holes. In the next example from a, from a different well, we'll, we'll, we'll look, look again at just, just the still images, three slightly different versions of the same image. On the left, with no overlays, we see uh, a good in situ example of, of screen erosion. Without doubt here, we've located the exact depth and pinpointed even the, the individual base holes responsible for, for where, where the sound production is coming from. So while this diagnosis isn't really what the operator would have wanted to see, the evidence we're able to provide here will help them understand exactly what they're dealing with. In the, in the center image, we've added a layer of dimensional information with lengths and widths of the heavily eroded areas. When erosion is present over larger intervals that are captured in the single image, these, these measurements can be a very straightforward way of comparing the severity of the erosion at different depths. And this can help with remediation planning and also potentially allow, allowing erosion trends and patterns to be seen, again, to give a better understanding of the underlying cause of the sound, sound breakthrough. And in, the, and in the image on the right, we're looking again at the, the area me measurement rather than the, the length and which width measurements. Actually, we have another well. We've got some fascinating video of, of sand being produced from a, from a single perforation hole. Um, and unfortunately, we haven't got a release to, to, show you, to show you that. So all the images and footage we've seen so far has come from our, our current generation of, of high definition cameras. But what I want to show you next is where we're, where we're, where we're going or where we are with the, with the new generations of tools. So we're transitioning from the images you see at the moment to uh, a, a newer, better generation of tools. The, the limitation of the images that we've seen so far is that they come from a single camera that's facing directly onto the tubing wall and we're seeing only about 90 degrees of the wall at, at any one time. So if we wanted, for example, to see the full circumference or the opposite side of the pipe, we rely then on a, on a motor that turns the camera and this takes time, um, means the tool has to be stationary when we're turning. Um, and it also means that uh, we have to use surface readout techniques, so the engineer controlling the camera uh, can, can do that from, from surface. So for a short interval, that's really probably not an interval, but when, when you're dealing with longer intervals of screens, this can be time consuming and, and becomes impractical for longer, longer screen sections. So the solution here is our new generation of tool. So this is the Optus Infinity tool, uh, which we've been researching and developing and engineering for, uh, for a, good, a good few years, and, and it is out and, and available and in production release now. So this is the world's first array side view camera, and its key, key features are the four azimuthally aligned on the same depth plane cameras. So you can see two in this image here. If we zoom in a little, you'll see them a bit better along with the two banks of, of LED. So this unique sensor configuration we've combined with advanced images processing te techniques. And with the images gathered, we can stitch together a, an image to produce a single image of the well born, a process we call mosaicing. And with that, we can produce an image that's 2,800 pixels wide and in theory, infinitely long. 
And Optus Infinity is available uh, in, in real time and in, in, uh, in, in memory mode these days. So what I'm going to show you here is a, a case study of actually one of the very first jobs that we did with Optus Infinity. And this is from a, a sand screen well in Europe. It's a gas storage well. And this well goes through multiple cycles of injection, presumably during the summer and production during the winter when the, the demand for gas is, is higher. And that is uh, probably not the best thing you can do when you're susceptible to sand production. Okay. So we're seeing the footage here from those four cameras as they go past the screens. And here we're showing the results of that mosaicing process I mentioned, where we've stitched the images together to make this single view. We can wrap that round a, a cylinder to give this more natural effect to looking at the, the images. And then we can inspect those individual perforation base holes uh, in, in, in detail, looking for erosion, looking for blockages. As we'll come on to shortly, we can also measure those images. So here's an individual base hole, and you'll see in the lower half that image is, is partially or almost half plugged up. And we've measured the diameter of that base hole, and now we're measuring the amount of fill material in it. And then we can summarize those results um, across different sample depths in the well. Here we're looking at the diameter, they're all about 0.37, which uh, agreed very well with the manufacturer's specs. So the conclusion there was no erosion had occurred. But here we're looking at the fill results. And you can see towards the bottom of the interval, there was more fill measured. So we're able to, that's some of those patterns and, and trends that we're able to identify that are hard to, hard to pick up just looking at individual images, but when you start doing the, the analytics and, and plotting out the results, they, be, they become readily, readily apparent. So in this case, um, the operator was able to target the, the clean out operation to remove the fill in the areas that needed to be, to be cleaned out. Um, and let's move on to even where we're going next with this. We, we've been working on image dimensioning for around five years now, and, and particularly on the perforation erosion that I mentioned for about three years. One of the drawbacks at the moment of the, of the service is it's fairly human intensive. That is, a lot of people are, or a lot of man hours are needed in, in the analysis. The process is semi-automated, uh, we can identify the, the perimeters of perforations from the images automatically in some cases, but a log analyst is always required to go in and, and check those and, and help make the measurements. And you can see for a typical perforated well that we're dealing with, that well may have around 1,500 perforations into it. And even that requires multiple people working on the images once they've been acquired to, to measure and, and analyze them. But when we're looking at sand screens, we're at least an order of magnitude more in the perforation holes or base holes to, to look at and measure. Um, probably more than an order of magnitude. We're probably at 40, 50, even 100 times as many base holes needing inspection and, and measuring. So that's, uh, that, that would be an enormous, an enormous task for, for human beings to undertake. So we are currently active um, and pursuing machine learning process to help with that. It's going to be a two-stage development that we're working on. Firstly, um, identifying the, the video frames that have perforations in them automatically. Currently, that's a manual process of a of an analyst working through the video, looking for the, 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 the camera 
images with, with perforations in them, but that can be automated. And currently we're able to do that with more than 80% 80, 80 success with, uh, with the machines doing it with no, no human interaction. And the second step will be improving our ability to, to measure those perforations and base holes once they've been automatically identified in the, in the video footage. So that's where, we're, that's where we're going with the technology as well. And then before I get on to my final summary slide, I would, thought I'd share this comment made by a, a senior figure in one of the major multinational operating companies. I'm sure almost everybody would agree with the, that the ability to, to better diagnose the condition of sand control equipment would help operators make better decisions on what to, to do next with their wells. And we hope you'll also agree that the detailed measurements and analysis that we can provide will play a key role in making those better decisions a, rea a reality. So just to move on and finish the, the presentation, Again, I'm going back to my slide that's heavy in video images and it's taken a moment to two to load. This doesn't, doesn't normally happen. Here we are. So just to finish off then, we think the application of, of visual data analytics has really transformed the way that, we, that we're able to use downhole video. The data density that we get now and the precision of the measurements we're able to make enables quantifying the features that's really it, it's not it's not available in other techniques that are that are out there and this has led to an expansion for us in the applications of, of, of video analysis um, certainly perforation analysis hydraulic frac is, is a big has been a major success for us and we believe as it's so closely related related sand Sand control diagnostics should should be the same. So I hope we've demonstrated the benefits of, of video and how it helps us improve and understand how we deal with complex screen related issues. And just before we go to question and answers, a um, couple of little things I'd want to share with you. Uh, some of the material in here was from a from an SB paper that we've that we authored. You can see the see the number there if you're interested to have a have a closer look at that. And then we'd also suggest, if you'd like to learn more, that you have a look at our at our website, where there's a lot of information, uh, more more case studies. I'm trying to show you the website. Sorry, that's not working. But evcam.com is where you need to go on the on the home page there. You'll find the, the name of the your local EV representative. So no matter where you are in the world, um, the system knows where you're where you're calling in from and will point you towards your, your local EV representative. Also on the website, um, if this webinar has been useful for you, we've got the, the previous webinars, if you haven't attended those and would like to catch up, they're all videos up on, up on our website. So with that, um, let, me, let me open things up for, for questions. Um, I'd be glad to try and answer any, any questions that you might, that you might have. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Um, there's a, a number of questions that came in about, um, right. you know, the visibility in in an oil well and whether we can we can capture um, footage in, in an oil well. Are you able to expand on that one, Glenn? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, um, yeah. Very uh, sensible questions. I've got some I've got some slides here that might help help with that. So, of course, yeah, visibility is the the biggest challenge. That we face with with getting good good information from 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 cameras, 
Um, there's a couple of there's a couple of things that we look at. Um, the solids content in in the water, or the, sorry, in the in the fluid. So that's measured by something called NTUs. Um, so we're looking for an NTU, a low solid content in in the fluid we're trying to see through. Um, and we also have to consider the the color of the fluid, the pigmentation. So the the two glasses you can see there with with coins at the bottom of of one on the left with water. Both actually have low NTU values, but just the color of the fluid um, prevents light transmitting through it, so we cannot see through that type of type of fluid. Okay, and uh, the camera camera we use, of course, is the same as the camera in your your phone. Um, it needs a visible uh, optical medium that can pass pass light light through it. On to a second slide here, showing what happens when we pass through oil. So here we're in, we're in a horizontal well in the water phase. And towards the top of the picture, you can see the, the oil phase above us. And in a moment, the camera is going to go up into that oil phase as the, the deviation in the well changes. And you, you'll see the effect it has on the, on the camera. So um, if, if this video is not lagging too much coming through to you, we're currently in the oil phase and we emerge from the other side into the, into the gas phase and the image is clear. Uh, no, no, no oil debris left on the camera. Um, and that's, uh, that's to do with the surfactant coating and the material of the lens itself designed to minimize oil sticking onto it. And the, the, third, the third thing we can maybe look at is, and this is usually a, a, a problem we put in place to deal with, with grease closer to, to surface, often from the wireline equipment that we're, that we're running with. Um, and here we have um, an, um, a material that uh, dissolves with temperature. So we simply place this over our camera lem lenses and when we get into the well and reach a certain temperature, this material begins to dissolve. And I should be able to show you how that works on the, on the camera. Um, this was on the left, we're seeing it being tested in the workshop where we've got some heavy grease um, on the left with the, with the protective film in place. On the second image, we are, we've poured some hot water over um, and the and the dissolvable material has dissolved, and we're, we've got the clear area now where the where the side view camera was, and all the heavy grease has gone gone with it. And finally, if I play the video, you'll see how this works in a well. The image initially isn't very clear. That's because we're looking through this material. But in a moment, you'll see that we reach the correct depth and the correct temperature. Uh, we're able to apply the brakes on the on the hoist system, and the bag, which has started to dissolve, breaks free. Uh, we, we'll start getting a, a clearer image, and there goes the the bag, and we have a nice clear image now. And within a few minutes, that uh, that bag will totally have uh, dissolved away, won't leave any residue in the well, and we will have passed the most hazardous has this part of the well, which is often close to surface, where there tends to be a lot of grease, grease and oil accumulated there. So th those are some of the issues. I mean, the other issues is if it, if it actually is a, a, an oil producing well, um, we can do different things there to, to manipulate the well. Um, as you saw in the first bit of footage that we showed there, you know, shutting shutting the well in and letting the, the fluid levels reach their natural levels may be uh, a sufficient solution to, to the problem. If the zone of interest that you're looking at is in, uh, in what might be a water zone or, or, a, or a gas zone and not in the oil zone, that can, that can, that can be just like that and we can, we can go and view those zones with the, the camera. 
or we can do things to manipulate the well levels with uh, pressurizing up the well or maybe pump, pumping nitrogen. So we have, uh, we have a lot of experience in this. This is something we do day in, day out. Uh, we're running around a thousand of these operations a year. Uh, so we've got a lot of experience on how you prepare and clean a well for these type of operations. So no wells, no wells ever the same. And it's something that we like to and need to discuss with the, with the operator ahead of, ahead of time. And in most cases, we can find a, a good solution so we can get good, good images. I hope that, uh, hope that covers, the, covers the question adequately there, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Um, hopefully that, that covers the, the number of questions asked there. Um, going back to, to San Vier um, as a service, um, Paul's asked a question here. Um, he's asking, considering the man hours required for analyzing base holes, how long does a, a typical job take? Um, yeah, good, good question, Paul. <laughs> It's hard to say that there, there really isn't a typical job. So, um, you know, the, the variation in the number of, of, of base holes is, is huge. Um, and really the operator needs to make a decision on, on how, many, how many base holes to, to analyze. All the, all the base holes that are captured in the video can be, can be visually inspected relatively quickly. The human eye is very good at uh, picking up where where any anomalies exist, and then a certain subset of those can can be can be measured in a in a practical time frame. It depends how long you've how long you have to to wait for results, what the urgency is, and you know obviously the length of the length of the screens, the the number of base holes in there. So there is there is no there is no straightforward answer. Um, I imagine we're for horizontal wells. We're we're probably talking a number of man days, if not man weeks, to to do this type of work when the when the sampling rate is quite high. But um, yeah, a lot of lot of variability there, Paul. Yeah, and Glenn, just to to add to that, I mean, you're absolutely right. The 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 number of screens that you have to analyze, and, and particularly their composition has a big effect on that. But the the other important thing that we can stress here is in, in most cases we're, we're running the video as a real time service, either on wireline tractor or intelligent call tubing. And in that case, you, you can see a combination of the down view or side view images in, in real time. And in a number of cases, we'll identify a particular uh, anomaly or, or area of, of let's say high erosion or presence of sand in, in the, the sump. And we can inspect that and look at it there and then. And on top of that, when, when we finish the operation, the, the video can be played back at any point. So you can skip to depths and areas of interest using our, our software or, or play it back as a, as a regular video file. So you, you can get some information on critical areas extremely quickly and then beyond that, the, the more statistical analysis that that's Glenn showed here, when you're really looking for, for small changes and, and trends, then that's the part that may take a little bit longer, but uh, certainly some quick answers in there too. Okay, uh, well, just whilst we're here, uh, we, we had a, a couple of other questions. Um, there was a, a question here from uh, let me just check who it was actually. Can we see sand coming in into the well in, in real time? Um, Glenn, do you want to comment on that? Yes, um, yeah, I kind of alluded to that as we as we went through. Yes, yes, we have certainly seen it. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a customer release on, on, on any of the footage that I could share with you, but yeah, we've, we've certainly seen it. It's uh, it's fascinating to see, um, and we've seen not not only the sand coming in on 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 one side, but the damage it's been causing actually on the opposite side of, of the wellbore where it's where it's where it's striking the the casing casing wall there. So 
yep, we can, we can, we can capture it in in real time. If you go out, I, I think the cases we did it, we weren't, we weren't actually planning to do it. Um, the well was designed to be shut in. There wasn't meant to be any flow, but there was some cross flow in that situation that was creating enough pressure difference for for that for that sand flow to be to be occurring. But it's something that we'd need to discuss and, and plan if if the if the well is to be flowed in real time with the with the camera with the camera down there. Okay, thanks, Glenn. Uh, we've got a question here from Frederick. Um, what is the risk of uh, running inside a, a horizontal um, drain with with a sand wave? Um, do you do you have to use a, a, a tractor to to get through? Yeah, good, good, good question, Frederick. Um, the, I mean, the two, the two usual options in in um, horizontal wells are either a well tractor or or, or conveyance on on coil tubing, um, and both of those can provide the option of, of um, real time real time video. So when that's the case, we know exactly what we're what we're going into. Um, some of the footage I showed you, I think, was. Uh, Think was memory based, and they. Uh, you're, you're right. You don't. You don't know what you're getting yourself into in that s situation. But um, yeah, the real time option. That's where. That's where it really uh, can can reduce the risk um, of of problems like that. Also, it can help us with uh, confirming the fluid clarity is sufficient to get good images while we're down there. If it's not, then you can take real time action to potentially improve the, the fluid conditions in, in the well. Whereas again, if you're if you're running in, in memory mode, then those options are not 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 really available to you to until you're back on surface do you understand uh, the, the the fluid the fluid conditions you were you were dealing with. Anything, uh, anything more there, Mike? Yeah, we've got a question here from uh, from Eero. Um, what range of solutions do you have after identifying the the source of of sand ingress? Um, our our main job, Eero, is is that identification. We are we're a, we're a diagnostic company. Um, other people normally take over at that stage. We we don't offer solutions ourselves to. To the problems. I mean, we 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 we, we of course we have knowledge of them. Um, whether it's might be plugging off the interval by whatever method, uh, somehow you you need you need to do that. So if it's the bottom of your well, that's probably fairly straightforward. You you set a set a plug. But if the if the region where you've got problems is in the middle of the well and you'd still need production below it, um, you might need to be looking at straddle type solutions there. Um, these are these are not things we offer ourselves. So our job is to to go out and find where the issue is exactly, and then you can you as a, if you're an operator, you can think about what are the what are the best solutions. Now you've you've better understood what the what the issue is. So hope that uh, hope that covers that question, Mike. Yeah, Glenn, I think you had a, a nice little. Uh, flow chart and some uh, options there on slide five if you just want to pop back to that one um, uh, and again the the solutions for remediating are in most cases relatively simple tried and tested techniques and the, the challenge is just knowing where to apply them and and what the the surrounding area looks like so so that's it there L lots of options that in most cases uh, your conveyance provider would would be able to supply uh, some of them a little bit more specialist um, and if you if you have a range of those available with you during the intervention then it may be if it's a, an isolated issue it may be possible to do a, a single trip or single mobilization diagnosis and repair which is ultimately the aim of, of most operations okay thanks glenn Shall okay. I, uh... Yeah, we've just got one uh, one one quick question there. Uh, from, Great. From Alexi. 
Um, he's asking, uh, can sand properties um, such as the particle size lithology be determined through through images? Um, I would say, Alexei, that's probably stretching what we can do with the with with, with the camera. I mean, we have we have great resolution, um, certainly better than, better than any other downhole diagnostics, and we can we can see individual particles of of sand certainly. But uh, you know, identifying them down to lithology and the size would would be below the resolution of the the camera. Actually, I mean, we can we can measure things down to a, a thousandth of an inch. But um, I think we're probably talking about microns for for sand particles, and, and and we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to resolve that that well from the from the downhole images. You'd need to need to get a sample back to surface for, for that, um, I feel. Any more questions at all, everybody? Please, please feel, feel free, either speak up or, or through your microphone or please type a, type a question. Well, I, I, I tell you, tell you what we'll do, Glenn. Whilst uh, people are digesting what we've we've shown, um, if you want to hand over, I'll I'll just take a, a quick tour through the website and actually the the results we got from the the poll, which people have been uh, donating answers to, which is very very good. Okay, that would be interesting. Yep, I've uh, unshared token. You take it from there. Okay. Well, hopefully everybody can see my screen now. Uh, so let's just check that. That coming through, Glint? It is, yeah. Yeah. So there were there were just a couple of other questions that we can we can actually help summarise here from from our website. Um, Glint mentioned about getting in contact with somebody from the EV team, and if you just scroll down on the home page, you'll be offered the the most proximal or local sales representative to you based on where you are in the world. So for me and my home base here in Aberdeen, uh, I've got the lovely Mike Emsley as my local contact. Mike's got several years, I, I should be kind and say years rather than decades of experience. And a lot of that is involved in well intervention, camera operations, and even the repair of, of some of these issues with uh, with solutions. So I think that that reflects well on the whole team that you will be speaking to somebody who, who has been there, seen it uh, and done it, uh, along with a lot of other techniques and operations as well. So a very experienced group to talk to. But as well, uh, additional case studies, you can see those from, from our home bar up here. Uh, these cover a range of different applications. Uh, there are lots of videos, and we typically release a video case study every month with a supportable, uh, supported PDF download as well. Uh, and you can filter these by a particular type of technology, a particular intervention or conveyance method, or a particular challenge uh, itself. So just here we can see other sand related uh, case studies that we've we've put out and you can see those videos in in full on the website. But also we had a question about the tool specifications, operating environments uh, and other operational parameters. And again, we, we put a little bio of, of every one of our technologies on on the website. And there is there's a PDF that you can download with uh, a, a typical data sheet on there. Uh, so if we wanted to look at our E-Line camera, for example, you can see the different options available and, and download those. Here we have them at different temperature and pressure ratings. So the, the core of our cameras are 1 and 11 16th inch diameter or 43 millimeters. So a 2 and 3 8th tubing and upwards is absolutely fine. And we typically operate up to 125 Celsius as standard, 15,000 PSI. But we do have variants of that that go up to 200 degrees Celsius, and even some cameras that all operate in excess of 20,000 PSI for, for deep water applications. So th there's a wealth of resource available here for those that are interested. But as I said, th the simplest thing is have a look for your local contact if you don't know who they are already. And, and we're here to help. That, that's what we're here to do. If you have any questions, we'd, we'd be very happy to help answer them.